So how is everyone now? Everyone, has it been good? Yep. Yeah, okay, great. All right, um, we have a couple of questions here already. I'm just going to start while we actually collect. And the first one I'm going to ask Gary. Um, and the first one in terms of, uh, in terms of the people are talking about currencies and currency pairs. Yes. Uh, how to choose a, uh, basically a currency pairs, uh, which will give a higher probability of profits. Um, yes, how we, uh, that is individually to the currencies that is weak or, or strong. Could you share some of that? How would you choose a currency pair? Um, I think the first thing that, that's a really good question because there are various currency pairs that one could use to trade and make money from. But the, the, the key thing to remember is that there shouldn't be a favourite currency pair because all currency pairs will move. Your job as a trader is to collect the movement in pips as opposed to the price in pips. So the actual value of the currency pairs is irrelevant because as long as it moves, it will make money. That being said, we usually classify our currency pairs into three sections, the majors, the minors, and the cross pairs. The majors are the ones that move the most in the shortest period of time. Those are things, for example, like the euro against the US dollar and the pound against the US dollar. Going down to the minors, which move a little bit less, and then the cross pairs, which move even less. But despite popular belief, the market themselves is actually very transparent. They actually tell us what they're going to do next. If you just know what to look for. And if you know what to look for and they give us the clues, they'll let you know. So I think the key thing uh, and the answer to that one is, how do you choose? Well, I think it's a case of let the market tell you. If you know what you're looking for on a technical analysis, the market will literally tell you what is the best one to take at that moment in time. I hope that's answered the question. Okay, so um, understand the market. So more, for basically the first step would be be educated. Educated, yes, right. Okay, so we, we know the steps, so get educated. Mm. I'm going to, because we, we're still waiting for questions here, I'm going to ask this first question to Gabriel relating to insurance. All right, and this is talking about um, health insurance here. Uh, how to, and in this case, you know, what happens obviously when you do fall sick? Right? So the question here, how to prevent an insurance company after that you have actually, they have actually made a claim from paying a relatively health, a hefty health claim, like a heart surgery or bypass operation from your, so if you made a claim uh, already from your policy, all right, uh, how to continue with the medical insurance policy after you've actually made a claim. You're, are you considered a bad risk? Okay, uh, let me try to understand this question because um, um, I, I presume you're asking if I have done a claim and the, the policy has expired and, and how can I buy a new one or are we talking about the existing oh, okay. one? That, uh, I think it's existing one. So how, how do I continue existing on with this, uh, this thing? Obvious, and obviously it goes on to, and perhaps you're going to share in terms of how could, could I actually be insured in the future? Oh, that, that's a little bit tricky. Um, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me dwell a bit on the medical insurance uh, plate first. Um, and all of us are very familiar with the shoe plans and, 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 and the coverage. Um, a little bit of advice uh, when it comes to medical, the shoe plan is, is, is vital because it is the one of the very rare ones that, that covers still a hundred and, and is guaranteed renewable. Um, uh, most of the other insurance plans in the market might expire at a certain age, 65, 75. Or uh, if you are trying to buy a new one after you, you found a major claim, I think it's going to be very tough from, from the medical history. There's typically a five years wait out period before they, they even consider whether you are insurable or not. So my advice to you, whatever the schemes there are in the CPF uh, arena, uh, please make sure that you don't opt out of it. Uh, stick to it because I think, I think they are vital to you for long-term medical coverage. Okay, so uh, stick to it. I think the best way for, for me, personally, my view is that the best way is to stay healthy. <laughs> so uh, have an active lifestyle and stay healthy. 
uh, at the end of the day, we, I think we started off early on this morning, we talked about uh, total, we're talking about being peace of mind, uh, holistically, so health is one aspect. We didn't, we didn't, we're not recovering the financial aspect, so health is one, being healthy is one. I think here is a question for Sean, uh, and uh, I think you brought up in terms of looking at the sectors, um, I think maybe Jeff can actually add a little bit of this as well. In terms of the food and beverage sector, seem to be, and then you've highlighted in this case, uh, bread talk uh, to be a value, uh, looking at from a value investing perspective in the sectors to invest in. Would you agree in terms that the food and beverage sector gives a fairly bit of value? And uh, what are your views on the companies like uh, Thai Bev? Okay, uh, I have a fellow master trainer who says, put your money where your mouth is. So, in fact, you talk about like, uh, even food sectors or like cigarette sectors. It's interesting because once people get hooked on, they continue going back for more. And uh, of course, when we talk about value investing, what is very important, I mentioned, we must understand the business. So, most, for Singaporeans, I think food is a wonderful topic, right? Okay. And of course, uh, in, in fact, a, a, any sector, You'll be able to find value companies, but you have to understand them. You have to see how they multiply, how they structure the business, whether it's the person or the business. So, for example, Mac McDonald's. There isn't. You, you don't see Ronald McDonald's. Okay, there's, there's no Ronald McDonald's. There's, you don't see people actually. Uh, there's one chef actually cooking the McDonald's. It's a system that duplicates. That's why they are they are in a three no 19, 19, uh, 119 countries, 33 over thousands businesses all over the world. So, and you talk about uh, Thai beverage, you, if you look at the fundamentals, you will find very interesting things. That, that, that's, that's what I can say. But unfortunately, I don't understand that very well because I, I don't drink. But uh, my friends who are in there will say that it's a good business as well. So it depends. If, if you are drunk, then you will know that it's a good business. <laughs> okay. Jeff, could you share a little bit more about the uh, food and the sector in terms of in Singapore, uh, in terms of the Singapore sector? And I, I believe that Thai Bev has recently even been included into the STI index, is that correct? That's, that's correct. Uh, Thai beverage was uh, recently added to the STI Straits Times Index. Again, um, what, what, what's, what's interesting, that they're two very distinct sectors in a way as well. Uh, if, you, if you look at the food producers that we have listed on the Singapore Exchange, we have nine of, we, nine of them, of which one of is Fraser and Neve, thus you have eight active trading companies that representing the, uh, the beverage producers. We also have 26 food producers um, uh, on the SGX that uh, have a wide range of sort of history of performances and so forth. Now, the, uh, over the past 12 months, the price performances of all the beverage, the, the nine beverage companies have all been positive, uh, albeit there has been some range there, whereas the food producers have been more mixed. Uh, therefore, there's been some negative uh, performances. There's been some positive performances as well. There's been some outlier performances. So there's a great deal of range in terms of the actual food producers and the beverage producers. So you have, a, you have ultimately a, a selection or a potential choice there of over 30 stocks. Um, there's, a, there's a column Alvin Fu wrote in the Straits Times yesterday talking about the actual beverage stocks as well. And he he uh, made note of what some of our retail brokers in Singapore, uh, the research uh, people of those of those brokerage shops, have been saying about the uh, the the, uh, the the sector. So, please, um, if you if you did want to know more from a journo point of view, there uh, log on to the Straits Times, look up the Alvin Fu article. There's uh, we we cover it only from an educational point of view at the SGX. On the My Gateway, I wrote a market update last week on the food and beverage uh, sector itself, and that's that's available, of course, on the on the on the My Gateway website or on the See Us homepage, which will be there next week. Thanks. Okay. Um, question for Gary. Um, I think you can trade currencies in several ways, and I think this question was asking specifically to you. Uh, do you trade the currency cash or futures? And why? And I'll also throw back to, to, to uh, Jeff in a minute. Um, yeah, great question. Um, you, there's a number of ways you can trade. You can either trade cash, as I said, as in getting in now, or trade into the future prices. Personally, I trade cash. Uh, and the reason, quite simply, is because I want my money working for me quickly. I'm a short-term momentum trader. In other words, I want to get in, 
I want to get out, and I want to take the money. I'm not there for the long term. The whole point of trading in the first place is to make money. Now, if I can make and do a percentage gain in the shortest time possible, then I'd take a very short term view on it. So as a short term momentum trader, I'll take a trade that could be anywhere, say, say from 20 minutes, be in, out, take the money, to usually a maximum of two weeks. In, out, take the money. My money's there to make money as opposed to sit in there for a long term trying to make um, a, 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 a long term investment gain. The other reason why um, it's easier to trade or better to trade the cash rather than the futures is that the cost of trading. The spread usually increases with a future price. Uh, the brokers will charge a spread um, and their spread are usually far more dynamic and competitive the shorter term that you're in there for. And that's the reason why I trade cash rather than futures. Okay, we've heard a trader from a trader's perspective. I'm going to ask this question in terms of, I understand that SGX has recently announced that they will be uh, introducing uh, currency futures. Uh, could you share a bit more about that, Jeff? Sure. Uh, we, we, we have consultation paper out, out in the ether at the moment uh, discussing bringing on uh, currency futures onto, onto Singapore exchange. Uh, there, there, there's, there's obviously a, a clear role for it. Um, you, if, you, if you wanted to build a vibrant marketplace for a secure future, you, uh, you need to have the, the right products listed on the exchange. And uh, I think it's very much complementing what we have already uh, developed in the equity market. We have a number of companies, a number of portfolio products such as business trust, real estate investment trusts, exchange traded funds that are basically providing equity exposure, not so much in Singapore, but throughout the ASEAN region, throughout the Asian region and throughout the world. And it's only appropriate that we have complementing those equity products uh, products where you're able to hedge your uh, currency risk as well. We, while we in Singapore are uh, obviously uh, have one of the best performing currencies on that gradual modest appreciation place, our sovereign, we're only uh, three, we're only one, uh, one of three uh, countries outside of Europe and UK that have AAA ratings with all three uh, rating agencies. Uh, while we have that great foundation in terms of our own currency, obviously investors are wanting to have more exposure to the region, the opportunities, the challenges of the region, and appropriately hedge it, that equity exposure with currency, uh, currency products as well. Thanks. Okay, with a um, little bit more macro perspective from, from SGX angle, going back to something more personal in terms of, uh, in terms of life for insurance, uh, Gabriel, uh, this person, has bought a um, life insurance policy in 1965 and named the wife as the sole beneficiary. Unfortunately, uh, she passed away in 1998. At the same time, this, per uh, this person has made a will and indicated in the will that he wishes to have the eldest son receive the maturity and death benefits. Now, do, does this person need to inform the company of the change in beneficiary since the wife has already passed away? Uh, if I do, besides the will, do I have to submit any other documents to the, um, for the change of beneficiary? I think okay, quite uh, a few people might be in this category here, you know? Okay, uh, we, we are on a very, very, very uh, sensitive topic of, of this um, implied section 73. And that's why uh, early on I was talking about this new section 49L, section 49M. Because under the implied section 73, um, the moment you put your spouse and or children as beneficiary, it forms a statutory trust. And technically, you, you can't change the beneficiary. Um, uh, in this case, the, 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 the spouse has deceased, is deceased and technically should fall into the estate of the, the deceased, uh, which is the spouse anyway. It could have fallen back to the son. Uh, uh, in which case, I, I suggest um, 
whoever asked the question, I think, I think this is very sensitive and we, we, should, we can sit down and discuss at the side. But, but as a, for general information's sake, uh, because of the intricacy of Section 73, which has been done, with, uh, they have done it, uh, took, taken it off. Now we are talking about Section 49L, which is similar to the old Section 73, but it must be, must be uh, 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 written and no longer implied. And you've got a choice of it with Section 49M, which is revocable, so they can change it anytime you like. So um, those old policies, unfortunately, uh, because of the operation of law, it's very difficult to revert back um, um, the particular beneficiary they name inside. So, um, but going forward, we don't see the issue anymore because of the, the new section that, that came about to replace the, the act. Uh, so if you, if you uh, have put spouse and or children in the past, uh, time to review it. Some insurance companies allow revoking it uh, if you go down to customer service and they, they still do it, they still do. All right, but uh, for this particular, whoever asked the question, I, I suggest we take it aside later on. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I think it um, sounds quite complicated, a little bit more detail, but I think, you know, it sheds light that some of us do face those situations, unfortunately. I'm going to ask this question to Sean. Um, you know, Sean, you know, I choose a company today, right? I believe it's fundamentally, and we went through the screens that, okay, can buy love. But tomorrow, you know, I mean, some reports say, hey, some, is something happening in the environment, potentially, you know what I mean? What should I do? Should I, you know what I mean, in terms of, I already bought this, this counter, uh, but, you know, potentially in the short term, there could be some changes and fluctuations. Uh, do I sell? Do I, I mean, I mean, these questions do happen in a lot of retailers' minds. Do I sell? Do I continue to hold? How la? How la? Okay, sure. In fact, I can guarantee you once you buy this, this will happen. Okay, it's the, it's, the, it's the curse of the stock investor. Okay, once you buy a stock, you'll be more, how to say, open to the news. You'll be, you'll be hearing news, news about it. Actually, before you buy, right, there will be all sorts of news around anyway. So when you do your analysis, you must be able to actually go through like a scan. I talk about a scan. Because all this news, right, lightly revolve around the scan. It is not uh, wholesome and complete, but it covers a lot of anger. That's the first thing. And you must understand this. I would like you all to think about this as you are a business collector. Right, I mentioned that uh, Warren Buffett collects business. Uh, Peter Lim collects business. There was a, so, so if you want to collect the business and be like so-called like the major shareholder in the company, do you want the price to go up or go down? In the long run, you want it to go, to go up. But in the short run, you want to collect as much as possible. So I remember there was a, this a AGM in UOB, an annual general meeting. So there was a guy ask, asking Mr. Wee Chow Yao. He said, hey, Mr. Wee, how come the, how come the UOB stock price goes down? Huh? Do you know what was his answer? He said, go down, buy more. Lah. That's why he told the shareholder. And the shareholder was a bit upset. He said, buy with what? Toilet paper. <laughs> it's, it's a fact that we may not have all the money, but you see, sarcasm won't get you rich. It is about knowing, really looking at the company, knowing that he has a, he's going to make more money. And, and I, I like the idea that you, you analyze the company in a long time frame. But when there's a profit in the short run, you can take it as well and you buy it at a lower price again. So uh, in the short run, if it goes down, the company is still stable. You should not sell, you should buy more. But you must have the confidence. That's where it's important to do the analysis. Yeah, that's my take. Thank you, Sean. And um, I'm just going back to Jeff here. We're talking, um, one of the questions here was relating to uh, investing in ETFs. Um, and then you showed the example of the, the STI gaining 10.4% in a year. Uh, does that mean that the STI ETF will also return me a 10.4%. Yeah, the, the exchange-traded fund on the Straits Times Index tracks the performance of the Straits Times Index and invests in the stocks of the Straits Times Index and thus is a quite a clean representation and uh, portfolio of the Straits Times Index. So the key variable where it is not producing uh, the same return as the Straits Times Index is known as tracking error and that is uh, it's quite low for both STI ETFs because they are uh, they are still cash based ETFs but there's 30 stocks that are quite easily replicable in units of the uh, of the of the stocks that the ETF managers 
hold for us on their behalf. So tracking error is, uh, is, is a consideration to take into account, not just for the Straits Times Index ETF, but all the ETFs that we have listed on, on, the, on the SGX. So there are there are so I think besides that, any other costs that would I be looking at? Yeah, there's there's an, we call it uh, a all in fee, if you will, the access fee of uh, of these ETFs, which are all less than one percent for the majority of of the ETFs. Some of which are less than half of half half of a percent, and that's paid on an annual basis. And then of course you do have dividend distributions as well. And in the case of many indices like the Straits Times Index, which has semi-annual dividend payments that average around 3% per year, that well over well compensates for the, uh, for the management fee of holding the ETFs as well. All right, good, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to ask this of um, Gary. Gary, in terms that what are the pitfalls uh, if you're looking at, you know, looking at trading uh, currencies, what are the pitfalls to look for when you look at trading currency pairs? Um, where do I start? <laughs> the pitfalls from trading the currency pairs. Um, th th there are just so many, and this is why it's unfortunate a lot of amateur traders tend to lose more money than they make because um, the, the potentially they're going for their quick buck as opposed to the steady growth in trading thing. It, it's, it's not a lottery ticket. So one of the biggest pitfalls, I think, is not knowing what to do. And just because it's moving doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make money from it. However, that being said, uh, the two predominant pitfalls that most amateur traders do are, and the mistakes they make, first and foremost is not taking into account price cyclicity. Um, as in all asset classes, it will move in cycles, in price cyclicity. Here there's a, uh, what we call phase one and phase two. Phase one will always be in the direction of the trend, so the general movement, and phase two will be counter trend. There is a tendency amongst amateur traders to try and steal that phase two part for a quick profit, whereas if you wanted to trade more safely, you'd always trade in the direction of the majority of the market, in other words, the trending place. So getting in and trading on phase one and getting out at the end of phase one and just staying away on phase two would be a really good start. So, because the market's moving in that direction, you move in that direction. And I think the second biggest pitfall that amateur traders make is that they try and trade the news. The news only has two functions as far as I'm concerned as a trader. That's number one is to report what's already happened and number two to speculate what's gonna happen based upon what's happened. By which time the market's already moved. It's very, very hard to try and speculate what the market is going to do based upon news that's already come out. So my suggestion would be to use news as when not to trade, as opposed to use news when to trade. When there's a huge uh, part, uh, news item, let's say the, the, the biggest news item that traders will use globally would be NFP, non-farm payroll, uh, the employment figures in the US. When that news item comes out, you've got to be nuts to try and trade it. Just stay away from the market. And as, as I say to everybody that I, I, I mentor and teach is, what is the worst that can happen to you if you don't take the trade? Nothing. Live to trade another day. So using news correctly to stay out of the market will not only keep money in your trading account, but allow you to move in at the right time to take the trade. And those are the, literally the things we, you know, trying to avoid those pitfalls in the training that I give. I'm sure you'll share more of this during your... I, absolutely, a lot more. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Gary. I'm um, just going to go back to um, Gabriel. Gabriel, this is one a little bit more macro in terms of under, in ter understanding in terms of the, the, com the uh, insurance companies. How does the insurance company make their profits and how do they grow their profits? A. And then B, part B, in terms of, in relation to uh, in terms of how do the insurance companies then invest the client's premium uh, and how do they grow the money or, in terms of all the premiums collected? To, to answer the question, I need a chief investment officer to be here to talk to you, but uh, uh, what, what, what can briefly, you, 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 okay. briefly. <laughs> See, see the, the premium they pay, we're talking, I presume we're talking about PAR plans uh, rather than the term non-PAR plans because those are risk premium. So if you're talking about power plans, let's say a whole life, and you pay X dollar premium, 
the risk premium is there to, to pay for mortality, morbidity charges, and of course, it could be reinsured out to the reinsurers who take the bulk of the, uh, the, the insurance risk. The insurance company then take that, 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 that par, uh, what I call bonus loading portion and invest. If, if you remember my slides on the par fund, that's exactly how the, invest, the insurance company does. They treat it as a fund. It's just like if you do a, a, a collective investment scheme, they treat it like a fund and then the fund managers to invest it as if you are the individual investor, except because of the aim to smooth the return, you don't, you don't get the immediate, oh, this is 15% return this year, next year you're minus two. So what they do is that they take it and they, they, they do a little bit more than that. But if you ask me what's the instruments, the investment, exactly uh, uh, what I showed you just now on the 75% fixed income, 25% equities, loans, and, and the rest of the assets. So it's absolutely no difference uh, compared to if you have invested it yourself, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, this is the fund manager at the back end that's managing that, that billions of dollars of funds. No difference. There's no special secret to how the insurance company does it. Uh, the investment portion. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think Vitova, I mean, time is up. Um, I think the speakers will be around. Could you please give a thank you to Sean, Jeff, Gary, and Gabriel? I noticed there are a lot of G's with me today. And um, we will be start, we, as I said, the, the, we will have these recorded and put them up on the website. Uh, you can revisit them. They'll be up on the website in two weeks' time. Um, and those who are you uh, who will be with us in the next session, we, uh, those who have not registered, you can actually be back here. We will start at 1.30. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. <laughs>